So there's not a lot of new information on when to save an arthritic hip, but I hopefully will give you some guidelines. Uh, I, this is what I've been doing for most of my career. These are my disclosures. So when I was a resident, I really was interested in preserving hips because we were doing too many total hips uh, on, pay, on essentially normal hips. People who probably had FAI, we didn't recognize it. And this was considered a conservative treatment, but didn't work out well with resurfacing. So I felt there were too many hips uh, that were being replaced. And that's why we began to explore hip arthroscopy as an alternative back in the early 1980s, since everybody's thought about treating painful hips with a hip replacement. So we started doing debridement starting in 1984. And we found by 19, late 1990s, when Leith Fargo did this paper with us, that we did we were doing pretty well. Um, even with debridement of the labrum, we still had an, a lot of patients that went on to um, hit, undergo total hip replacements, about 21%. And then Tom Bird also published on the same subject and found that within three years, about 30% by five years, 50% went on to total hip re replacement. And, and it just wasn't consistently good to do arthroscopic surgery. And then this is a paper in 2014, just reminding people the evolution of joint preserving surgery, which was kind of lost uh, in the era of early total hip replacement. So we did a little study on our own and looked at hips we debrided from 2002 to 2008, and we did 213 hips. And we found, we did all, all, all our people with arthritis, and here's our average age group of 48, and we improved most people but we still had a 21% that went on to total hip replacements. And what we tried to do is just add the, the treatment uh, that you would with Gonza's techniques, except we did it arthroscopically. We did a capsulotomy and here's our view arthroscopically compared to the open technique. And we were pleased we could do it, but I'm not sure we really changed the natural history of osteoarthritis. So we found out that if they had more than 50% joint space loss and less than 50% range of motion, especially the postmenopausal females, they just didn't do that well. And especially if they had unrealistic, unrealistic expectations or my expectations were unrealistic, they also didn't do that well. We thought it might be a bridge in some patients like we talked about earlier today. So then Ben Dome, you know, in his wisdom created this algorithm and he published this in 2015 and found that the current evidence is insufficient to have a cutoff for how much is too much arthritis. And, Pretty much after tonus grade one is probably a cutoff and less than two millimeters of joint space is a cutoff. But Tom Bird published on, on tonus twos, which I see a lot of in some of those work. So my philosophy evolved from replacing joints, which is what I was hired to do in 1982 as a joint revisionist. And I would just listen to the patient's desires, determine their pathology, and I have an algorithm to determine their prognosis. And I evaluate my own surgical skills and follow the trend of their recovery just be honest with the patient and be ready to change course if it doesn't work. So, you know, you have to have the expectations of the surgeon match the patient because the recovery can be pretty lengthy. So the stressors, what was actually mentioned by Dr. Wolf is, this is a good example. I, I did this total hip on this right hip and they paid me and I did an arthroscopic surgery in this left hip. And because of tonus two arthritis or three, I wasn't paid. So it just adds stress. So when is the arth uh, arthritic hip worth saving? Well, if the damage is not beyond repair, uh, they have adequate cartilage as Javon just talked about. Um, you don't wanna have too much damage and they have functional range of motion, a positive attitude, and they're willing to accept the risk. And my best wisdom as far as diagnosis is not anything new. You just have to make the right diagnosis. Is it arthritic or non-arthritic or is it something that may cause arthritis such as AVN or PVNS or synovial chondromatosis? So you wanna you know, parse those out. And imaging has been talked about. We don't have to go over it again. Final imaging really is your arthroscopic uh, view of the hip to see really how it is. This is a labrum that many of you would probably re reconstruct. I saved it and it seemed to work. So you carefully evaluate the x-rays. We won't go into that in any more detail because it was talked about, but make sure you look at all of these areas on the, on the x-rays. The technique is really nothing new either. You're basically, once you decide to do the operation, you know, you've got to commit yourself to the procedure, even if it's worse than expected, and go ahead and do all the techniques you've all learned with arthroscopy, such as debridement, femoroplasty, acetabuloplasty, and the rest of the things you do with what we do today for FAI surgery. And I usually have stages of surgery that I talk about with my residents. The first stage is exposure, then resection of bone, and then finally repair. 
And I'm always, I'm not that concerned always to go in the central compartment, especially if they have arthritis. You know, make sure you do your pre-op fluoroscopic evaluation so you can compare it with your post-op fluoroscopic evaluation and make sure you do the right job. And as everybody knows, I really emphasize capsulotomy. You know, with a capsulotomy, you can get a great view. If you have a great view, you can do your surgery. If you don't get a great view, you can't do your surgery. And also make sure you don't kill the lateral epiphyseal vessels because if you do that, ball games over this example of an open surgical dislocation by somebody else in the military and they killed the hip with an open surgical dislocation. Make sure you plan and execute your sculpting of your femoral head neck junction. Uh, make sure you have a plan and do it perfectly because it's really important that you do as, as good as you can and sculpt so that you contour to maintain a labral seal even if the seal goes on to the femoral head neck junction, even if it goes beyond the cartilage and make sure you contour your femoroplasty so it's perfect, so you can preserve your labral seal. You need to plan and execute sculpting your acetabulum, so make sure your osteoplasty your acetabulum is perfect, because you really you can't, you can't uh, not do a perfect job if you're gonna try and get a, the ideal result. And we all know about debridement, microfracture, I think it does work, um, and also you wanna preserve the labrum and cartilage whenever possible. A lot of people would cut this cartilage out on the right side of the screen over here, and I tend to preserve it. Um, obviously, if, if there are loose bodies or synovial, synovial, uh, uh, hypertrophic synovium, take it out. Now, this is something I think that's very difficult to do, but I always do a notch osteophytectomy. And you can see here, here's the notch osteophyte on the left here, and here's after it's been removed. It's a tough way to do it. You have to really distract a lot to get it done. Uh, label management is going to be talked about quite a bit in our sessions, and I don't think we need to talk about much more. Just make sure you either repair or refix the labrum. I tend to preserve even these degenerative labrums because they, they, they do function. And if necessary, we do an intercalary graft. I tend to use the reflective, reflective of the rectus femoris. And capsular management is important. I, I have been convinced you do need to repair the capsule whenever, you, uh, whenever possible. So here's an um, example of a failure. Nice to show you failure first and end up with a success. This is a 57-year-old female postmenopausal. 2014, we saw her. By 2015, she was uh, getting a little bit worse. We uh, went ahead and debrided her. Uh, she had significant articular cartilage damage and flap cartilage, which we try to preserve. We might even microfracture behind them and glue them down if necessary. And then we do our femoroplasty, and this is a failure. Two years later, she uh, had more pain, and you can see the joint space uh, failed, and she went on to have her hip replacement. This is a success, a 26-year-old dancer. I gave her eight years from age 26 to age 32 so she could dance and, and build her career. Nobody would do this kind of a case right now, but I did and back in, in the early 2000s. And it gave her eight years, and then now she's had a resurfacing, and she's a very famous dancer locally now, but it gave her eight years to build her career, even with some pain. She didn't expect to not have pain. Here's a 53-year-old female, 13 years after a failed right hip arthroscopy. And it's, she doesn't have severe arthritis, but she, but she was told she should just go on to a total hip because she's 53 years old and she's perimenopausal. And this is what it looks like inside her hip there. Here's, this is not a graft. This is preserving her native uh, labrum. This is the damage she had to it. And this is after the osteoplasty. And this is on the left hip, which hadn't been done before, just to give you an example of, you know, arthroscopic surgery of the, of the non-arthritic hip, but you see she still has damage here. You just want to do a perfect job. And this is her at three years to demonstrate for me that she's still doing well. And, you know, this is just one of my successes. It's, it's, uh, it's nice to have success. So when you're making your decisions, you know, I talk about the use of, a, of an algorithm. I'll go through this quickly. Here's my degenerative curve versus time. You want to make sure you're on, don't get on the hyperbolic part of the curve, otherwise you're going to fail. And this is just kind of how I see it. One other out, way to look at it is with the degenerative curve. If this is where, this is where the total, oops, sorry. My screen did this. If this is where the total hip, because of pain is, is done over from degeneration, most people don't need, um, a hip replacement in life. The major population don't. Um, this is the degenerative curve, older people with DJD. This is the younger person with the DJD. 
this is where you don't want to go. You do not want to, you know, if you're only going to buy this much time, it's not worth it. Um, if you can give, have this happen, then it is worth it. And so this is kind of the way I see uh, dealing with degeneration in, in younger people. So can we preserve the, the hip, uh, the arth can we preserve selective arthritic hip joints using arthroscopic technique? I think if you define the amount of cartilage damage, you, you choose the proper patient, you use advanced arthroscopic techniques, and you're critical of the outcome, you can do it. Um, I have a 50-50 rule. If they have 50% range of motion and flexion and on internal and external rotation, as Javon talked about, at 90 degrees, that's good. If they have more than 50% uh, articular cartilage or more than two or three millimeters and you have a motivated patient, that's good. And that's what I use to uh, figure out when I'm going to do it. But always talk to your patient, find out their desires. Thank you very much.